Welcome, welcome to the Evening Show with Jackie Brambles. This is the middle hour where we get to enjoy a great conversation with one of our favourite artists of the 70s, 80s and 90s and a little meander through their most meaningful musical memories. That opening track, Mama, number four in 1983, may give you a clue as to who our special guest is tonight. His first band, Genesis, sold, oh, only about 100 million records or so and his second one, Mike and the Mechanics, hasn't done too shabbily either. So it is my pleasure Pleasure to invite Mike Rutherford in for a great conversation tonight. Uh, good evening to you, sir. Good day. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And it's uh, it's great to see Mike and the Mechanics back out on the road. The refueled tour rolling into Birmingham this Saturday. Then Milton Keynes on Sunday, Landudno on uh, Monday, then onwards to Guildford, Cambridge, Reading and Portsmouth before continuing on to Germany. Uh, is, is it pretty much the same lineup with Andrew Roachford, Tim Howard and co on board? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great... Yeah, it's a great, same as the last sort of 10, 12 years. It's a great bunch of guys. They all do different things. You know, Andrew Roach has got his own solo career. Yeah. Uh, the normal drum, uh, he does Tom Jones's head of music. Um, they all do other things. And um, uh, and this time we've added, because our drummer's had a little, little, he can't make this tour, Gary Wallace. Uh, we got, I asked Nick Collins, Phil Collins' son, to join us. Um, and he said yes. How amazing. How lovely to have that sort of um, passing of the baton, the drumming baton. I know. Well, I mean, on the last tour, he was fantastic on the Genesis tour and got on really well. He's a great drummer. And I wasn't sure. Yeah. He lives in America. Would he want to do it? And then my wife said to me, drummers love to drum. Yes. Um, and yeah. She, like, How not? I mean, uh, quite as a little side tangent, quite something to become a drummer when your dad's known as being a brilliant drummer. Uh, but he's obviously, it's, it's obviously a genetic gift that runs in the family. Yeah, I mean, people always sort of ask that question, you know, compare them. You can't. Phil's an amazing drummer. But so is his son, Nicholas. And what's, I mean, we spent 40 plus years with Chester Thompson on live on stage drumming. It was fantastic. But from the jazz world, and so in a way, Nicholas grew up with his dad, understanding sort of English drumming and how English drum feels work. Yeah. So this last Genesis uh, and his dad was great to play with him because he really understood. He plays a bit like his dad in a nice way. That's good. That's great. How amazing. That's really, that's lovely. And and obviously, Mike, you must absolutely love touring because, I mean, you're not that far long off the back of a huge Genesis tour, which kind of got semi-interrupted by COVID, but you managed to finish it off last year. It's a little hard just because the, what would have taken a year to two years, you know, stopping, starting, rescheduling. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I, I prefer making records. But nowadays, to make a record, such a lot of work. Yeah. It's a year of pain and can I do it again? Um, I'm not sure a record is what I want to do at the moment, and touring's so easy. Right, yeah. You have a start date and a finish. And, and life, on the, life on the road now, how would that differ to life on the road from back in the day? Um, well, obviously, I mean... Somewhat more sensible. Well, in a funny way, it's quite nice, because the mechanics never really toured in the early days with, with Paul Carrick and Paul Young. We'd hardly any any live shows at all. I can't quite remember why, but um, so in a way, bringing these songs to, onto stage, people have not heard them much. It's been quite uh, quite enjoyable to do. Sometimes, sometimes I... The Living Years, a huge hit for Mike and the Mechanics, got to number two in 1989. Uh, that version we just played is the updated 2019 acoustic version from the Out of the Blue album with Andrew Roachford on vocals. Uh, so, Mike, let's take a wander back, if we can, through the mists of time to find out where your musical influences came from. Do you remember the first record you ever bought? The first record I bought was an LP. OK. My sister had some... Oh, but she had, we had one, she had the record player. It was in her room, so she played a lot of Elvis, but which I liked, but not enough. And then I bought the first Cliff Richard record, uh, the album, and the first track was called Move It. Oh, yeah. Incredible. I went, I went to see him, I was probably aged 11 or younger. Wow. Um, in Manchester. My father worked up there then, and um, unbelievable. Just been, Did you immediately think, right, that's what I want to do then? No, not that age. It was, there was no career to be had in those days. It wasn't like, what are you going to do? I'm going to do that. Um, it wasn't until later on, I guess, when the Beatles and the Stones and the Who came out, we were a bit older than us. Not by a lot, but mostly it seemed a lot between sort of yeah. um, 13 and 18. Um, unless we wanted to do it. But even then, you know, when you're 18, in those days, you thought, 
two or three years, you know. I never looked very far ahead. And here I am, 54 years later, banging away. <laughs> Seems to be working out OK. Well, it's, it's been it's been a wonderful time doing what I do. I mean, how, how lucky to do what I love doing is my, is my job and career. I mean, I can't get, get better than that, really. Come on, pretty baby, let's move it and groove it. Cliff Richard, Move It, the first record Mike Rutherford ever bought and the first live gig he saw too. And we have that in common, Mike. You were 11, I was 7 or 8 and threatened to run away from home if I wasn't taken to see Cliff uh, because he was just so cool. Uh, We will be back with our special guest, Mike Rutherford, for more great conversation next. Welcome back to the evening show with Jackie Brambles. Great to have your company tonight where it's just you, me and Mike Rutherford of Mike and the Mechanics and of course Genesis cozying on in for a great conversation and a rummage through the record collection of your soul, Mike. Uh, so, So let's talk about the genesis of Genesis. When you guys first got together then at school as a band, were you were you fairly serious? Were you sort of looking at the stones thinking, right, that's the direction we're going, guys, let's go? Or was it just a fun sort of thing to do while in amongst the studying and the school stuff? No, not at all. Um, uh, you know, a very repressive boarding school in those days. So no, we released mm. the artistic side. But we didn't want to be a band. We had no intention of being a band. We wanted to be songwriters. Um, that was our ambition. Right. You know, because prior to we were like the songwriters uh, and the artists, and they weren't the same people. So we thought we'd be songwriters. Of course, at that time in popular music, Bands wrote their own stuff. And so the demand for songwriters fell. Right. So we had to form our own band, get the songs done. And do you remember who was sort of, when you were starting to get some kind of attention or traction from the music industry, Do you rem- who would have been your contemporaries, sort of to the left and right of you, who were also starting to get a bit of attention and yeah. sort of a sense that you, that you were in a cohort that was going to break through? Well, there a lot of bands who we, we support. Everyone who's been in the band, we supported. Um, I guarantee you. But the same era, like bands like Lindisfarne, Vandegraaff Generator, all those sort of bands. Um, no one, and in those days, you know, your career didn't take off. Mm. Your career went upwards slightly, you know. It was a very slow process in those days. I so clearly remember buying that single, Run For Home. I have the world's worst memory, but I think every final purchase has a photograph of it lodged in my mind. Uh, Linda's Farn, contemporaries of Genesis in the early days. And, and I suppose, Mike, the massive difference that bands like Genesis would have certainly benefited from compared to today is that there wasn't the same enormous pressure to be immediately commercially successful. You were given sort of... Um, the space you would have, you know, a multiple album deal if you did get signed back then, and you'd have a little bit of space to grow and evolve. Yeah, I mean that, that's a very important. I think kids they understand it. An amazing way to learn have an apprenticeship. Yeah, you know, the, we did two or three albums in two or three years. They got better, but we're learning our trade, you know. And it wasn't a bit like, oh my god, that wasn't a big hit. It sold a few copies. Um, pay for the petrol, you know. In a sense, that was sort of you could learn your craft. Yeah. Now it's got to happen so. Quick, so globally publicized that it, it, it's it can help but it can also be uh, uh, quite difficult yeah because i think you you don't necessarily get that the luxury of learning your trade the hard way you know having tough crowds you know the grind of the road before you are rewarded with the success sometimes the success comes and then some artists are maybe not quite ready for it 100 percent. i mean i think you know you, you learn your skills in the back of the van up and down in england and america too it's a great way to learn how to making our, our audience work um, and become a band. You know, it takes time to become a band of players. Yeah. And now things go, since MTV, things go so fast sometimes, you miss that step out, which is a shame, I think. Um, I'm just looking up here, your, your first Top of the Pops appearances. You were on quite a few times, but without being in the studio, from what I can gather. I think your first studio appearance would have been 13th of March, 1980. Right, Top of the Pops, there were like album bands and singles bands, and you couldn't be both. And our first semi-hit was called I Know What I Like. And Top of the Pop said, will you come play on it and do the song? And we said, no, you know, we're an album's band. Our manager freaked, freaked out, you know. Yeah. Um, he went ballistic. Um, <laughs> and then I thought we wanted to follow you, follow me, maybe, uh, our first single. But in a sense, it was a, 
I never was, was the best fan of it, really, but it was the only TV show on, so you watched it. Of course, of course. And, and do, you, do you remember sort of, was there a, was that the big impact whereby after you had appeared on Top of the Pops a couple of times, that's when people recognised you when you were catching the bus or going into the supermarket or walking up the street? That took an awfully lot longer than that, trust me. Um, Did it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's always, it was always a weird show to do because it was great fun and the DJs were nice, but in a sense, the audience were just like a bunch of kids from down the local school. Yeah. I you know, didn't really know who you were, what you were. Um, but it was a great, great vehicle to just get, to get things moving. Follow You, Follow Me, the first song to break the top ten in the UK, got to number seven in 1978. So was that a a pivotal, significant turning point for Genesis, or did it feel like a very long time coming? Well, in in many ways, our our growth was so slow, almost too slow. You know what I mean? It's sort of a... But when it happened, I suppose when you start doing arenas, you you listen, listen, you you never get to this world. You're always trying to get to the next thing. Um, I suppose we were an albums band until that song Follow You, Follow Me, mm. which is a sort of a big hit for us, but in quite a nice way, quite a soft, romantic song, but it's in across, across all the boundaries. All, all our kind of uh, audiences who like more the prog side liked it too. Yeah. Um, and when you're doing multiple in America, you know, two or three nights in places like that, you do feel uh, you've done good. And did you ever get sort of thrown onto somebody else's tour in America? As you know, the record companies tend to, do is put you on as the support to get you some sort of you know exposure to vast audiences do you remember whose tours you would have been on because sometimes they work brilliantly don't they because you share an audience and other times they are it, it, it's it doesn't feel like a good fit we should have done that we didn't do it we had a sort of small production into some lights and stuff which you wouldn't have been allowed to use so we only, only ever did two support acts in america both with lou reed oh that's a good fit well in an ice rink in pittsburgh right. fairly empty once both of them read, had a same agent. Uh, so, in fact, our, our, our growth in America was slow. We did our, our own shows on our own lights, our own our own complicated sets. But um, I see the use of it now, really. Yes, yeah. Uh, what about in terms of, you know, really, obviously you've played many, many times over the years, but in terms of ones that sort of stick out in your mind for good or for bad reasons, a particular uh, gig that you did, perhaps with, other artists on the bill that were very impressive. Do you have anything that sort of stands out for you? Yeah, because the weird thing was in our day, we didn't, we didn't really do festivals. There weren't so many around. Mm. Um, and what happened was, if you could do Nebworth on your own with a couple of other acts, why go on a bill where it's not your audience? Um, we did a one, of course, yeah. We did a one of a tour in nineteen seventy eight around Europe. Um, actually, we were the we were the, like, we were the headline, headline bill. It was Frank Zappa. Right. It was fantastic, and then Bob Dylan. Oh wow. Who was Bob Dylan, <laughs> and then Joan Baez, right? Who was so popular, everybody. sort of bang a bang a cowbell, bang a beer, yeah. can, <laughs> uh, and then us. But uh, it kind of worked. Oh, that's funny. Virgil Kane is my name, and I drove on the Danville train. That got to number six in 1971, the night they drove old Dixie down from Joan Baez, tour mates with Genesis in 1978, cowbell and all. Uh, And we will be back to continue our great conversation with our special guest on the evening show tonight, Mike Rutherford. That's coming up next. Welcome back to the Evening Show with Jackie Brambles and to our great conversation with our special guest tonight, Mike Rutherford of Mike and the Mechanics, who are currently on tour in the UK and, of course, originally a member of Genesis. Um, As we remarked upon earlier, Mike, you've had this incredible 50-plus year career in very successful bands. And to that point, the way that a band is made up, the lineup of a band, the way that it can change over time, obviously, you know, Peter Gabriel left the band and then sort of Phil stepped forward and and then Mike and the Mechanics was sort of a side thing and Phil had his side thing. What's your overview from where you are now about how much that matters? Yeah, well, I, I think I think I think in a funny bit, Genesis, uh, um, we're a unique band in the sense that most bands who did solo careers, you know, guys did a solo album in between band albums, were kind of a bit frustrated. Yeah, and so it was a, a, a sort of our case was just so opposite. We had a, we were having a great time. But Phil got divorced, went to America for Canada to try and sort his life out. 
we had a gap, so we did a solo album, Tony Banks and I. We realised that actually the, the break from it, the change from being away from Phil and Tony was so good. So when you re reformed again, you know, for the next album, you were fresh. And the solo, I think the solo stuff kept us going a lot longer because we had the variety of being able to go away. And I think we were very lucky, actually, in that Phil's first solo album in the S night, which kind of took off unbelievably. You'd have thought maybe that he might have gone and off and done his own thing, but at the time it took off, we were in the middle of a band album, Abacab. So in a sense, it was great, sort of, and he was loving it, you know. I think it's been our saviour rather than our, our causing any problems. In the air tonight, got to number two in 1981, and really the song that heralded the start of a massive solo career for Phil Collins, but still successfully working in tandem with Genesis at the same time. Were there, Mike, ever conversations about calling it quits at any point along the way? No, you know, when Peter, you know, when Peter Gabriel left, we all thought, well, maybe that's, that's time to call it a day. And then we wrote some songs and thought, this sounds good. You know, when change happens, you don't look for it, but when it happens, something new comes along. Yeah. Like this next, we've got a new, a new drummer joining us, which will bring a whole new energy, which is great. And tell us about how you came across um, Andrew Roachford. He's a friend of, of mine of old. How did you sort of discover him and think, all oh, right, you'll do? Um, <laughs> well, there's a guy called Brian Rawlins, uh, who's a sort of producer mentor at Metrophonic Studios, which is near us in Guildford. He recommended, he said, he recommended both try Andrew out and um, try Tim Howard from, from, sort of from the theatre world. Andrew came down the first day and, and I think he thought he was coming down to have a chat, you know. And I said, well, there's a keyboard, you know. And off we went, sort of wrote a song, you know. I think he was, I think he thought that Genesis and people like me were very sort of musical, like, you know, the thinkers, you know. Yeah. Rather than just back a couple of chords out and go, well, that's quite nice, you know. I'm much more sort of, um, uh, not wilder. When I write, I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I make mistakes, I make a mess, you know. Spontaneous? Brave, yeah. Yeah. And I think that got on with us. And he's, um, and in return, he's actually, you know, I mean, on stage now, being around him. He's so relaxed. It definitely relaxed me on stage. In the last Genesis tour, having been with Randy for 10 years, I felt so relaxed compared to before. Um, just the atmosphere he creates on stage is fantastic. Cuddly Toy, a huge hit in 1989 for the hugely talented Andrew Roachford. Well, listen, before we let you go, we always ask our guest artists uh, to choose the final track. Um, and if you can pick something, because you know that every time you put it on, it will deliver what you're asking of it, whether that's to soothe you if you're feeling melancholy or uplift you if you're looking for energised inspiration. What song would that be for you? A Lovely Day. Oh, yeah. Bill Withers. Well, I mean, what, what a song. I mean, it just, it just, it's just such a simple song. There's one chord cool change in it. You know, Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a classic moment. When I wake up in the morning, love. Great final track choice from Mike Rutherford. Bill with us, circa 1978, and it charted again in 1988, you may recall. Lovely day. Uh, and thank you so much for a lovely chat, Mike. Guys, please. Quick question. Is, is that the station that... Um, Ken's moving to, Ken Bruce is moving to. Yes! Well, please give him my regards. Um, such a, we had such a nice times with him. Um, I saw in the papers all the kind of moving stuff. No, please give him my regards. Um, and I think, I've always said one thing I've learned in life, that any kind of change, if you go before, if you move when it's, people say it's too early, it's the right time. So I think he's done a very sensible move then. So give him my regards, please. I will do, Mike. Thank you for that. All the very best. Thanks a lot. Mike Rutherford, a man of Genesis, a man of Mike and the Mechanics, and a fan of Ken Bruce. It's all top quality stuff, folks.